I've titled this message tonight, Make Room for the Altar. Make Room for the Altar. Let's read chapter 15, beginning at verse 1. Now the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa, and he said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you, but if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Listen to verse 3. For a long time, Israel has been without the true God, without a teaching priest and without law. But when in their trouble they turned to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found of them. Let's stop there. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity I have tonight to be in the presence of the Father and family. I thank you so much, Jesus, for the Rising Fawn Church. God, those that are gathered here tonight and those that are watching on Facebook Live, there's people watching that we never even know of that will watch us on YouTube. And we just thank you. And we pray, God, as they listen, they'll also be drawn close to you. I pray, God, that they, as well as us, will make room for the altar. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep your Bibles open. We're going to go through all of chapter 15 tonight. There's only, what, six, 19 verses. We'll make it through all of that. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tiptoe into chapter 16, believe it or not. Uh, in a conclusion on page 5, I will tiptoe just a little into chapter 16. I want us to look at the, at the, at the life of Asa real quick. Uh, Asa is the third king of the southern kingdom, uh, the kingdom of Judah. And Asa ruled for 41 years. Well, he died in, in the year of his 41st year. Asa followed two kings who had done a lot of evil in the sight of, of the Lord, his father Abijah, Abijah and his grandfather Rehoboam. Both of those men were evil, and they did evil in the sight of the Lord. But for some reason, Asa, after his father and his grandfather left seed of evil in his life, there was something in Asa to be different. There was something about Asa, and isn't it interesting how you can have a grandfather as a wicked king and a father as a wicked king, but for some reason, there's a longing inside of you to be different. So I need to stop right there and tell you, I don't care how bad your family members have been. I don't care how, how much evil your family has done, how much evil your daddy did or your great-grandfather or your great-great-great-grandfather because there's something inside of you to be different. God has placed a seed of faith inside of you to, make, to be a world changer. He's placed something inside of you. doesn't matter how bad it's been. Maybe your grandmother, like Asa's, worshiped idols and, and drew vulgar things of, of the sexual goddess and, and did all these vulgar and, and has to be removed from her seat. Can you imagine saying, hey, Grandma, you vulgar and you nasty and you worship idols get out your chair and get on somewhere you ain't sitting up here on this holy throne unholy uh, uh, wow he had to move granny out the way so you need to know no matter how bad your family tree is it doesn't mean you have to be bad it doesn't matter if every root uh, every branch on your tree is rotten you can still be green and faithful all right so you have to hear and obey in spite of the way you were raised. The problem is, America, we are bad about making excuses and linking everything to the way we were raised. And we love to be able to think everything has been passed through. Listen, there are generational curses, not denying that. But why don't you be the one where the generational curse is broken? Why don't you snap it like Asa did? You don't have to do like your great your grandfather did. You don't have to live like your father did. There's something about you that God is creating for something great but why is that and Lord help me not to get ahead of myself Jesus help me to stay on track because there's a group of people that Asa needed to lead back to an altar there was a group of people Asa needed to protect he needed to guide he needed to nourish he needed a season of peace not for himself but for a for the for the people of Judah sometimes God will cause you to have a seed of hope and a seed of different so that you can help and lead and guide people that have no other hope except through you in other words, there's people that may not have any hope unless you get hope. So don't you blame, well, that, it's just the way I was raised. It's just you don't know the, the things of life. No, no, no. Just hear and obey God and be what you're called to be. Don't worry about what was in the past. I better move on now. So I think I read through verse 4, didn't I? So let me just uh, start there without having to reread it. So God sent a prophet to Asa. 
so that he could choose for himself. It's interesting because Asa had a choice. He had a choice to do right. He had a choice to do evil. He had a choice to live in the curse of his father and his grandfather, or he had a curse to be uh, a choice to be holy. God did not leave you bound without an opportunity to be free. God is never going to leave you in a position without a way out. He's never going to leave you addicted without a way to be delivered. He's never going to leave you depressed without a way to get joy. He's never going to leave you in a place of, of mourning without having a place of joy to get for your escape. You need to know there is a place. So the prophet of the Lord came, and he says, now the spirit of the Lord came to, um, from the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa, and he says, hear me, Asa, all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you while you're with him. If you seek him, you'll be found of him, but if you forsake him, you'll be forsaken. But it's interesting, this line, the Lord is with you while you're with him. So my question tonight is, the, the thought to ponder tonight, had Asa already been leading into a way of walking with the way of God? Had he already been leaning in the way of, of, of renewing uh, the, the law? Had he already in his mind been longing for a relationship with God? Because in my mind, I see Asa walking in the cool of the day, and all of a sudden the, the prophet came and said, because you are with God, God is with you. And you need to know as long as you're with God, God will be with you, but as soon as you forsake God... God will forsake you. Can I tell you, just get along with God, walk with him. If you'll stay close to God, God will stay close to you. If you'll, try, if you'll strive, listen, that doesn't mean you're not going to have cold times, desert times, dry times, winter seasons, leaves falling off of trees, hurricanes blowing your every. Listen, it doesn't mean your, your radiator ain't going to go out on your car like it did on my truck. It doesn't mean you're not going to have troubles, but it just means God is with you. He's with you. He says, look, if you'll seek him, you'll find him. Seeking God equals finding God. Do you really want God? Then begin to look for him. I mentioned that maybe last week. You will never find a God that you're not seeking for. You're not going to just out of nowhere have a big apple of God hit you on the head and you go, oh, there's a God. I know you're going to look for him. I'm going to say it again. Seeking God equals finding God. If you're really, listen, people are seeking for all kind of peace and joy and, and acceptance and love and they're seeking all that kind of stuff. They'll find it in illicit uh, relationships. They'll find it in drugs. They'll find it in alcohol. They'll find it in more money and overworking. They'll find it in more toys they'll find it. they'll do anything they can to find to have more but the thing they're looking for is a God that is greater than all of those other things and if you seek him you'll find him look at verse 3 because this is interesting for a long time Israel has been without the true God and without a teaching priest I want you to think about this. For a long time, they've been without a true God. In other words, they had a form of godliness but did not have the power. And we're told from such turn away. I believe they still had their rituals. I believe they still had their sacrifices. I believe they st still went through the form of their religion, but they never had the true God. And we have to be careful because we're living in a modern time where we love to have a form of godliness but no power. And God is raising up a remnant of people that will say, I want more than just religion. I want the power of God. He's getting a group of people that is willing, and I believe we are it. We're part of it, rising fund, that we can tap into the glory of God, and we're not going to be satisfied with just another church service, just another Wednesday night, just another, just another Sunday morning. No, no, we need something. Because you can go through the motions of life in church all your life and not have an experience of the true God and have how sad it is we would sit in the temples of God and miss the presence of God. How sad it is to sing the songs of God and miss the anointing of God. How horrible it is to hear the word of God and never receive the deliverance of God because the absence of the true God. But watch this. There was no teaching. He says you've been without a true God and without a teaching priest. How will you ever know the true God without a teacher? Woo! In other words, if you don't have a pastor or an evangelist or somebody that stands in a pulpit or stands behind a podium in Sunday school and teaches you the facts of the gospel, you'll never find God. You'll never long for him. You'll never look for him. You'll never seek him because without a teacher, the people will perish. I know the scripture says without a vision, the people perish, but without a teacher, the people will have no vision. Oh, <laughs> Woo! 
know you're about to stir something in me. So which came first, people with no teacher or people who are not teachable? People with no teacher or people who are not teachable? Because what I am believing is the reason the teachers left is because the people stopped being teachable. The reason the preachers stopped preaching because nobody would receive their word, their correction, their rebuke. All they wanted was exhortation. All they wanted was acceptance. All they wanted was to be fit in and to feel something. They didn't really want the teacher that would tell them how to sanctify themselves. They really didn't want a teacher to tell them how to live holy or righteous. They just wanted to learn how. Maybe I'm not talking about them. Maybe I'm talking about the current modern church where we can have feel-goodisms and we can have chills and we can hit an organ cord and we can flash a light and we can cause the mood to change during the altar service because that's the modern thing. Thing, and I'm not against that except for a little bit but uh, my, my, somebody said to me this week I was once again trying to get lights and they said isn't it cool at the altar service you can change your color scheme to change the ambiance I don't want to change it with the color of a light I want the wind of the Holy Ghost to blow in the church I don't need a light change or a fog machine I need a teacher to teach me the way of holiness and the spirit of God flows in that's what we long for So let me challenge you, be teachable. Be somebody that can be set through, sit through a service and be able to receive the correction, the rebuke, and the exhortation of the word. Be able to have the word discipline you. Ah, when was the last time you read the Bible and stopped in mid-sentence going, oh God, forgive me. That's what the word does. When you are a faithful reader of the Bible, you cannot read from Genesis to Revelation without causing some pauses in your life to go, God, forgive me. (laughs) Because the word teaches, it corrects, it rebukes, it exhorts, and it will exalt. But the problem is if you're unteachable, you only skip, skip all the sections that tell you how to be blessed and you only read the blessings. But you don't ever get blessed because you're not able to go through the process to receive a blessing. Oh, where are the teachers? Where are the teachers? When the heart is not willing to be taught, the teacher will stop. Can I tell you pastors will leave churches because they feel like people will no longer listen to the word they have. And they'll go, my work is done here because I'm no longer being effective. I've asked that, my, my wife and I have asked that a bunch over the 13 years we've been at Rising Con. Are we still effective? Will the people still listen to the word? Will the people still listen to the voice and the vision? And the thing is, but, but the thing is, when you stop listening, it's either time for me to go or it's time for you to change. Because if you're not going to listen to me and you're not going to listen to the next man, then the, it's not the person behind the desk that has a problem. It's the people that has the ears to hear and they're not willing to hear. Let me just say something, though, about ministry. Uh, and I'm talking about me. I ain't even going to talk about your other pastors. It's Sister Sandra and Brother Bobby, Sister Genevieve, they were the, they're the only people in this room that were here Ben and Nikki came several months later, but they were the only people that were here day one that's in this room. No, Johnny. I can't, how can I forget Johnny? All of you extras are people that came later. If you would talk to them, you've seen, and even people that have been in the church seven, eight, nine years, my ministry has changed and changed <laughs> and changed. I've been going through a process of change just this year. All right, and and it's because what happens is the Lord begins to grow me and change me because He's growing you and changing you. How can I ever take you to a place that I've never been? How can I get you to go to a level that I'm not at? So if I'm not changing and growing, the church will never change and grow with me. If you ever outgrow your leader, you don't need your leader. 
So I have a responsibility to change and to grow, to allow myself to be sanctified and, and not be afraid for ministry to change in my life, realizing that I, on April 24th, 2022, birthed a baby, and I know that baby brings change, and I know that change is going to look different, sound different, tap in different. I'm going to pray over members to get join the church and start prophesying. Why? Because of the change. But what God is doing me, every time you see me change, you better go, buckle up, baby, because we all change it. Because we're about to go to another level. I got to move on. Verse 4. Lord, I, this was supposed to be a one party, y'all. I'm just, oh. But listen to how awesome this is. I want you to see the grace and the mercy of God. They've been without a teacher for a long time. They've been without the true God for a long time. But listen to verse 4. But when in their trouble, they turned to the Lord, God of Israel, and sought him, he was found of them. Isn't it awesome? No true God present. No teacher present. Trouble comes and somebody goes, help me, Jesus. And he says, yeah, somebody call me. Isn't that's mercy? That's grace. He won't even let you stay longer than you ought to stay. So he won't even let you stay in that dungeon. He'll just come right there to pull you out. Why? Because he heard your cry. And God always responds to a cry that needs him. Let's move on. And in those times, there was no peace to the one who went out. This is the time with no teachers. This was the time with no real presence of God. There was no peace to those who went out, nor to the one who came in. But listen to this. But great turmoil was on all the inhabitants of the lands. So the nation, so nation was destroyed by nation and city by city. Listen to this, verse 6. God, this is the B part. God troubled them with every adversity. Why? To get them to call out. He allowed them to go through persecution so he could hear their voice again. If the only time you'll call out help, Jesus, is during adversity, he will allow you to go to adversity because he misses the sound of your voice. If the only time he can get you to look toward him is through adversity, he'll put you through adversity so you'll change your vision. Mm. Verse 7. Hey, now he's talking to Asa. But now, Asa, you be strong and do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. There was no peace, there was no victory, just pain and sorrow. Can I encourage some of you tonight if that describes your life, your family? Be strong and don't let your hands be weak. Stay faithful. Listen, even the most prayed up, Holy Ghost filled, sanctified, word reading person goes through a valley, goes through a fight, has some enemies, has some attacks. You go through ups and downs. It doesn't mean you're backslid. doesn't mean you ain't praying. It just means God, the devil, sometimes the, the enemy will attack you and sometimes the, the, devil, the, the devil will come because God wants him to come. But listen, however it is, whatever you do, don't you grow weary in well-doing. For in due season you shall reap. Can I, you know what I pray over the list of eight? God, we have been through a season of weariness, but we've not given up. The Bible says it's due time for us to reap. Amen. I ain't preaching the list of eight. I got too many aces to preach. Hang on, church. You will be rewarded. I know your past is sometimes full of sorrow and defeat. Your past is filled with family wickedness. But be strong. Asa, I know your grandfather was a wicked. I know your grandmother is perverted and sits on a high place and you got to demote her. I know your daddy's horrible. But Asa, you be strong. Asa, you be wise. Asa, don't let your hands go weak, man. You stay at the task and you'll be rewarded. I wonder if you've given up before the reward came. Just, I mean, if you'd have just stayed faithful for another week, you'd have saw the breakthrough. Amen. Don't give up too early. I better keep reading. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Odad, the prophet, he, he took courage 
And he removed the abominable idols from the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities which he had taken, the mountains of Ephraim. And he restored the altar of the Lord that was before the vestibule of the Lord. Then he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and those who dwelt with them from Ephraim and from Manasseh and Simeon. For they came over to him in great numbers from Israel. Watch this. When they saw that the Lord God is with him. Let's stop there. Asa heard the word of promise. Ah, oh, man, don't you love a word of promise? But I want you to watch what happens because here's what I'm afraid happens in the modern church. We will hear a word of promise, but we're never moved to action. Asa heard the word of promise and instantly began to tear down. Oh, I'm, I'm telling down every pole of Assyria. I'm, I'm, te- I'm telling tear every foreign altar, every idol. He began his, the promise put him into action. When you hear and receive a true word from God, your fruit will be obedience. When you get a true anointed word, now listen, you may hear it, but when you receive it, it moves you to action. You cannot have a divine word from heaven and go, well, that was a wonderful word from heaven. And sit in the same place. It's that word of action. I heard, I I read a quote today from Albert Einstein. You cannot get yourself out of a situation with the same mindset that got you in that situation. And we are trying to use the same mindset to get out of a situation that got us in the situation. No, you need a divine word of God. And when you get that word, let it move you to obedience. Let it spur you into action. Amen. So Asa, he took courage. He would remove the idols. He got rid of the things hindering God's worship. I wonder what in our lives need to be removed. You ever ask God, hey, God, what needs to be removed? What what in my life, God? What's some things set up on the high on the mountain that I need to remove? I'm worshiping you, God, around here. Do you know in the high places, you you read the Bible, you know in the high places, it, it often talks about, but he did not remove the high places. And this king, as a matter of fact, Asa, he didn't remove... Here's the thing. The high places were not just places where they worshipped idols. A high place was they'd worship God up there. It was just in the wrong place. So a high place was idols would be worshipped there and God would be worshipped there. But God wanted to be worshipped in a different place, in his house, in his place, in his surrounding and during this day. So a lot of times in our lives, we say, I worship God in church, but in your life, there's some things that you need to take off the high place. There's some altars that need to come down because you're hindering the work of God. Watch this. Let me use this and and don't let it sound crazy. There's some things in your nation that God, I'm talking about in your scope of life, that God wants to move in a mighty way, but you got to remove some things out of the way so God can move in a mighty way. If you really want God to move in a mighty way, there's some things you got to get rid of. So then it says, he restored the altar of the Lord. Now watch this. <clears throat> Many people, because, uh, l- l- let me, l- this is where the title comes from. Because I know some of y'all are going, well, Pastor Chris said this is make room for the altar. And Mandy sent me a song we could have played in the intro today on make room. So watch this. What did he do before he built hit the altar of the Lord? He tore down the other altars. He, he began to tear down abominable things, idols, the altars to other gods. He began to get rid of those things. And then he began to restore the altar of the Lord. Too many times we're trying to build an altar of God without making room for it. And watch what happens. In our lives, when we build an altar to God without removing the other altars, it becomes a hassle. Your worship to God becomes a hassle because you didn't make room for it. Ooh, church becomes a hassle because you didn't make room for it. Your service to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, minister to the orphans and the widows become a hassle because you didn't make room for the altar of God. You left all the other altars in place trying to worship God in the middle of all the other altars and now everything connected to God because God doesn't keep you at the altar. He doesn't keep you at the altar. He sends you from the altar. 
He doesn't keep you at the altar. He sends you from the altar. So what happens is when your altar is surrounded by all the foreign altars of other gods, every time he sends you, you have to work around the other things of your life, and it becomes a hassle because now you got to deal with all these other things, and instead of tearing them down, burning them, doing away with them so that God could give you access to mm, God. I'm I'm about to have a spell. God could give you access to him so you could have access to others. Watch this. When you tear down the altars and you make room for his altar, his altar gives you access to him. But because you've come to his altar, you now have access to people. So why does the devil want you to keep all the other altars around? Why does he want you to keep the altar to Baal and the altar to the Asherah pose and, and the goddesses of this and the goddesses of that and the blah, 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 blah? Here's why. Because it cuts off your access to other people. In other words, I can't minister to somebody after I leave church because there's an altar I'm stumbling over. There's a sacrifice I'm trying to get around. I'm hassled. I'm mad. I'm angry. And by the time I get to Kaylin to minister, I fought so many foreign gods that I don't have the anointing and the strength to minister because the access from the altar to the person has been interfered with because I didn't make room for the altar. Mm. God help me to oh, I'm about to just if I, if I get raptured y'all come on find me later oh, I gotta get back gotta get back is your worship is your church is your service a hassle or a passion because if it's a hassle you need to examine yourself and tear down some altars straight up <laughs> When church becomes a hassle, there's an altar you're tripping over other than God's. It may be an altar of pride. It may be an altar of selfishness. It may be an altar of envy, of lust, insecurity. But I guarantee you, when you serve God and it becomes a hassle, it is another altar you're tripping over. And you better start tearing them down and making room for the altar of God. Because through that access, you gain access to the anointing, to the power to lay hands on the sick and they recover. It's the access to his altar that causes you to be able to cast out devils. It is through the access of his altar that you now can save the lost. It's the, but, 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 we're trying to live in a multitask, multi blah, blah, blah world. And we have so many altars that the church has lost its effectiveness Because we did not make room for the altar of God. Mm. Make room for it. Make room for it. Make room for it. I better move on because I told you I was going to tiptoe into chapter 16. I should never make promises I can't keep. Oh, I think I can do it. So let's look. Oh, oh, let let me not forget this line. Verse 9, then watch this. Oh, how, I, did I not write this down? Sometimes, you know, when I teach, Revelation just comes without it being. Watch this. Then he gathered all Judah, Benjamin, and those who dealt with Ephraim. This is after he's tore down the other altars, after he's restored God's altar. Watch this. All of these people came over to him in great numbers from Israel. Watch. When they saw that the Lord God was with him. In other words, they took notice that he had been in the presence of God and they came not out of response to an altar, but out of the response that he had been with God. Because everybody might not see your altar, but they'll see the glory of God in your life. They may not enter into your secret place, nor should they. Because your secret place is an intimate... Oh, Lord, I'm about to go somewhere else, Felicia. By the way, so glad you're in church. Uh, Listen. Listen. Because what happens is when you invite too many people in your secret place, you can't be intimate. The best birth control is to have your baby sleep in the bed with you. Just saying. And we're trying to pile everybody into my secret place. Oh, I need you to come to my secret place. Oh, I need your intercession in my secret place. No, no, because the more people it gets in there, you're not being intimate. You're having a prayer service and a prayer gathering, but no intimacy is taking place. Sometimes you've got to be by yourself. 
so you can be intimate. It's out of the altar of intimacy. Ah, Lord, I want to preach. Out of the altar of intimacy, people will see the glory of God and be attracted to you. They'll come in great number. Do you know what's going to cause this church to fill up? It ain't the money. It ain't going to be new buildings. It ain't going to be new ceilings or new lights. It ain't going to be new fancy nothing. Here's what's going to happen. When we get intimate with God and the people see the glory of God, they're not going to care about the altar. They will care about the glory. And as it was in Solomon's house, when the fire falls, the glory remains. And that's why we don't want a wildfire, because a wildfire, a wildfire leaves no glory. A wildfire burns and moves on, but when a real fire falls, the glory of God remains. What we want is the fire of Pentecost to fall, and the glory of God, watch this, Good goodness gracious, because when that fire of Pentecost settled in that house, they didn't walk out in the street with a fire over their head, but they walked out with what? Glory on their heads. Do you see it? No, they, the people on that day who got saved on the day of Pentecost didn't see the fire. They didn't feel the wind. That was for those in the upper room. What they saw was a manifestation of God's glory in the people. Why? Because they had access to the altar. And why? Ah, my God, I'm having revelation. And the access of the altar of Pentecost gave them access to thousands of people to hear the gospel. And Asa's testimony was, and they just started coming. A lot of people began to pile in. Why? Because of the glory of God. That's why we preach and talk and sing and, and beg and plead for us to get into a holy, sanctified, righteous place so that God's glory can fall. Because if God's glory will fall, people will see God's glory and they'll come. Let us have an experience where God's glory can fall. Mm. Ah, Jesus. Whew, i got to move on. got to move on. Verse 10. Mm. So they gathered together at Jerusalem in the third month, in the 15th year of the reign of Asa. And they offered to the Lord at, the, at that time 700 bulls, 7,000 sheep from the spoil that they had brought. They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord of their the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart, with all their soul. And whoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel was put to death, whether they were small or great, whether man or woman. Then they took an oath before the Lord with a loud voice, with a shouting and the trumpets and the ram's horns. Let's stop there. Asa heard. Asa obeyed. Asa made room for the altar. The people came. Because you can't keep it to yourself. Mama just called. She forgot I'm in church. Mama, what you doing? Did y'all see how fast she hung up? She was like, oh, I forgot Chris is in church. <laughs> so listen, once you experience the true divine glory of God, there is no keeping it to yourself. There's, you just can't do it. And that's why I'm not sure a lot of church folk, even Pentecostal holiness, Church of God folk, have experienced the true divine move of God because they keep on keeping it to themselves. So Asa heard, obeyed, he made room for, he reached out, and they came. And then they began to offer sacrifices. I have one small question on verse 11. Can you offer what you're not willing to sacrifice? Can you offer what you're not willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to lay it down, slit its throat, let its blood spill, and give it to God? Because I feel like we're trying to offer God stuff and saying, oh, God, don't let it die. Oh, God, we'll come to the altar. I give this to you, God, I let, and then, but we never kill it, so it haunts us. We never kill it, so that familiar spirit on Monday it's gone, but by Wednesday, we are being led, right? We are tempted and, and being led back to because you're not willing to sacrifice. I must move on for time. Verse 12 through 15. And I just read most of that. They entered into a covenant, but I want to see this because this is going to make some of you understand why we do what we do. They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with their heart, 
with their soul. And whoever would not seek the Lord God was put to death, whether they're small or great, whether they're a man or a woman. And then they took an oath before the Lord with a loud voice, with shouting, with trumpets, with ram's horns. And all Judah rejoiced at the, or, at the oath that they had sworn with all their heart. And they sought him with all their soul. And he was found by them. And the Lord gave them rest all around. They entered into a covenant. They entered into a commitment to seek the Lord with all their hearts. It was an oath to worship God and God only. But listen to how serious this oath was. You're going to worship God or you're going to die. That'll make you fall on your knees trying holy, holy, holy on it. Sure enough, it'll make you worship. And I know in our days, we're not going to look at you on Sunday morning going, where's the sword, Rocky? We're about to, <laughs> we're about to get rid of some non-worshippers in here. We, we don't do that. We don't do that. But I will tell you this, a person who does not worship dies spiritually faster than a person who does worship. You will die a spiritual death without worship. Because you cannot live without giving God his praise and his gratification and his love that is due his name. So I worship, is some, it, it, you begin to worship and you begin to live. It refreshes your soul. It rejuvenates you. It, it brings peace. It brings comfort. But listen to this, and I'm trying to hurry. The voice of a united shout. <laughs> they began to, how did they signify the covenant? They be, trumpets, ram's horns. I mean, all these sounds, and people were shouting. Why do I want you to lift up a shout in the church? Why am I asking you to shout hallelujah? And y'all go, hallelujah. No, it's signifying. God, it's our commitment. God, we're signifying. We agree with the covenant. God, we're signifying. We want to make a deal with you, God. We're going to worship you and you only. So on Sunday morning when I ask you to shout and I ask you to have a battle cry and a victory cry, why is it? Because when God hears the unity of the people, he goes, I believe somebody's signing the covenant contract. I believe in somebody's saying, I'm going to serve God with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul. That's why we lift up a shout. So not only will God I know that we are making a declaration he is the one, but everybody around us knows that we're making a declaration that he is Lord. So raise a united shout, let it ring out, signify the acceptance and the approval of the covenant. So they sought him, they found him, and then they rested. Let me remind you, it's been a long time since they've had peace. So long the teacher stopped teaching and there was no true God, no fellowship. Years with no teaching. But the acceptance of the covenant shifted the atmosphere and changed the direction of the people. When they said, God will give you our everything, they went from a time of war and defeat to a time of peace and victory. Watch the atmosphere shift. And I know, I'm gonna, I'm, Felicia, I'm sorry it's your first time back in a while. I'm going to run over tonight. I'm going to go ahead and tell you. All right? Because I'm, I'm going to finish this. But it's not going to be long because Jennifer's done told some of her family. Now, he don't run over. He's real good about getting us out on time unless the Holy Ghost shows up. Well, he showed up tonight and blew up the timetable. So now listen. And they're not here. So here we go. So watch this atmosphere shift. Calamity, war, problems, unrest. God, we commit to you. Victory, peace. The shift was when they made a true commitment to worship him with all of their heart. If you want a shift in your atmosphere, to then you've got to get, let God be the only thing that worships. Every altar is destroyed, everything's out of the way, and you make a shout saying, God, I agree with your covenant. Let him shift your atmosphere. See, God wants you to have a season of peace. Listen, one of the, one of the prayers in my prayer journal is God, and, and I, I'm quoting scripture out of, uh, of somewhere else, God, allow Rising Fawn to go through a season of peace. We have been through some turmoil over the last few years. Let us now enter into a season of rest and a season of peace. But are we going to waste the ability during a season of peace? I'll get to that in a minute. Because during this season of peace, Asa sought the Lord, found him. They made peace. But verse, let's, let's look at verse 16 through 19. So they've made all of this stuff. There's peace all around them. Listen to verse 16. Also, this is after the commitment. We've shouted. We've committed. Also, he removed Makuk, 
the mother of Asa, the king, from being queen mother because she had made an obscene image of Asherah. And Asa cut down her obscene image um, and crushed and burned it. The brook, uh, Asherah was a sexual goddess. You can only imagine the obscenity. But the high places were not removed from Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was loyal all of his days. That's an incredible testimony. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa, Asa was loyal. He, but listen, he also brought into the house of God the things that his father had dedicated and that he himself had dedicated, silver and gold and utensils. And there was no war until the 35th year of the reign of Asa. So after the commitment, Asa continued to purge the land. In other words, Asa continued to sanctify the land even after they committed to the covenant. How does that relate to us? Because even after I got saved in 1986, I've had to do a lot of sanctification stuff in my own life. Oh, Lord, a lot since 1986, sister man, a lot. Hey, 2022, even a good bit now. <laughs> you know what I mean? That I'm still having to work through, sanctify through. But I, I, I'm, I'm so... You have to be willing to continue the process of purging even after your commitment. In other words, once you come kneel at the altar and you give your life to Jesus, you continue to purge the things in your life that are hindering you and God. Get rid of the stuff. Because what happens, happens is we often commit and then stop purging. We commit and we stop. God, I give you my life Yes, Lord, I say yes to your covenant. And then we stop. And we grow complacent. And all of a sudden, Asa has peace. And now it's the 35th year of his reign. And the king of Judah is celebrating a wonderful reign. And then an enemy comes up. And a great enemy comes up. Things have been great. Listen, it is so easy, and I'm almost finished. It is so easy to get too comfortable and too relaxed and too complacent and begin compromising during a season of peace. Because there's one thing about adversity, it's going to keep you crying out. So I guess my challenge to Christians is how do you keep that fire stoked even when there's no enemy to keep you on your defense? How do you keep a torch in one hand and a spear in the other hand or a spear in one hand and, a, and an axe in the other hand? How do you keep or a spear in a, you know what I'm trying to say, a weapon in one hand and a, and a okay, y'all got it. I had two stories mixed in and my mind never did like straighten them out. How can you keep doing both things when there's not an enemy pressing against your wall? You have to grow into a place of maturity where you keep on rattling it. And you keep on allowing the Holy Ghost to convict you. And you keep on getting intimate with God. Because I'm going to tell you a secret. The more intimate you get with God, the more you'll repent of God. At that dinner of two, and there's, I got, there's so many testimonies we've got to figure out how to start sharing. At the dinner of two, as soon as I sat down, I told uh, some people afterwards, I couldn't stop just saying, God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't even hardly breathe. I was crying so hard. I couldn't, all I did was repent. Oh, Jesus, I, I'm just so sorry, God. Oh, Jesus, please forgive me. I'm so sorry, oh, God. I'm, uh, and I just forever, until the Lord said, hey, look up a little bit, man. Lift up your head. I've heard your sorrow. God, I, you know, but it took, I, mean, I, I just wept forever, begging God to forgive me. When you feel like you're getting too comfortable, go sit at, go get in the intimate bed with him. He'll cause you to repent, Right? Listen, here, I want you to see this. And I promise I'm almost done. That's the second time I've said it. The third time, I'm done. There were no idols built. Watch this now. I promise, don't miss the ending. There were no idols built. There were no new Asherah poles done. There were new vulgar pictures hung on the walls. Queen Mother didn't get her seat back. They grew complacent in a time of peace. And when the enemy comes... Guess what Asa did in chapter 16 as I tiptoe through without reading? He says, hey, I'm going to make an alliance and a treaty with another country. And he not want, and it wasn't even wrong to have it. It's not, God doesn't mind you having a treaty with another country except when you leave him out. And there was such a season of peace, Asa never thought, I better check with God on this. There's a few stories over a few chapters later when y'all remember a king says, is there, Jehoshaphat says, is there not a prophet in the land we can inquire of before we fight this battle? 
Yeah, there's a prophet, but I hate him, is what the king said, because he only gives me bad news. Well, I got to speak to a real prophet before I do anything. Poor Oasa forgot God. Not an idol. Teachers, I believe, were still teaching the gospel or the law. Worship was still going on. The covenant was still being active except for now trouble came and they forgot to call on God. Remember, and watch this. And, and, uh, this is it. I'm closing my book. I, there's four or five more notes, but it's done. Because I told you, if I say it a third time and I was about to say, I'm almost done. I'm, so I'm done after this. So a prophet comes up and, and says, Asa, what did you do, man? God's pretty upset because you didn't call on him. And Asa, what did Asa do? He got mad. He got mad. Remember what happened when David was confronted with the prophet? He repented. Asa had an opportunity to repent, and his story could have been different. But instead, Asa, after all the years of peace, got angry because somebody said, you forgot God. And then some war broke out, got diseased in his feet, and he died from gout or got, died from gangrene or whatever. Some people says he had di was a diabetic. No offense, Jennifer. And uh, his feet got messed up and died. We don't know, but it just said he got disease in his feet. And he died kind of angry with God. And listen, the Bible says he did not even seek God in his sickness. How can a man who restored God to Judah at the end of his life be so mad at God that he didn't even say, God, I'm sorry, heal my body? He only sought the doctors. Are we any different? We come to church every Sunday, still in covenant, still in peace, but we'll only seek a doctor and not a God. Or when the pastor preaches a word we don't like, or a prophetic word comes down and it's not the tickling of your ear, you get mad and leave and try to find a make me feel good preacher because you did not like the word. You better stand. Felicia, oh, I am seven minutes over. I'm sorry. See, 